When Shad Thirion's mother heard a noise in the night and went to investigate, the last thing she ever expected to find was her son's decapitated head in a bucket in her basement. A police investigation would later reveal that it was his high school friend and lover, Taylor Shabisness, that was responsible. She choked him before butchering and abusing his body in a meth fueled murder. This is what can happen when an unstable and troubled individual engages in excessive drug use. This is the case of Taylor Shabisness. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Today's case is one that I've wanted to cover for a while. Just been doing my research and my due diligence and it is one that will blow your minds. If you have not heard of this case before, strap in. It is a challenging one to cover. And if you have seen this covered in the press, that you've watched other channels covering this case, I hope that I give some added value and insight to what you already know. Also, thank you to all of you who are supporting me on YouTube membership and Patreon. New content coming to you, so thank you for all your support. Can't do this without you. Let's get on with today's case. So who is Taylor Shabisness? Well, she was born in Chicago on November the 23rd, 1997. She was called Taylor Coronado then. She had a brother, Arturo Jr., or AJ as he's known, and the family actually moved to Wisconsin when Taylor was in fourth grade. Now, in May 2009, there's a real tragedy. Taylor's mother, Marla, dies. She was somebody who was an alcoholic. She had dependency issues, and she actually died due to chronic cirrhosis. Her father, Arturo Sr., he remarried just a year later, and when he remarried, he remarried a woman who had children of her own. Now, understandably, when you're going through the throes of grief, you want to connect with other people and it makes perfect sense that as part of his grief journey, he may be looked elsewhere to get his emotional stability and his emotional support. And obviously he meets a lady who he decides that he wants to spend his life with, but it is quite quick. When you think about the reality of having children, and he has two children, and they're dealing with losing their mother in a very tragic way, they are gonna need your attention and devotion. It's your duty and job as a parent to help your children come to terms with the enormous loss. If they see you move on really quickly, particularly if they see you move on really quickly and also introduce a whole new family to your environment, it's going to make them question lots of different things, including the loyalty you had to their parent. And it's going to make them feel potentially that their own grief journey should be as quick. And children rely on the adults around them to help guide them through grief. So understandably, they're kind of getting rushed through it to some degree. And remember, to get to a point from meeting to marrying, you're going to have had to be involved in that relationship for a period of time. And I guess for those children, they just really hadn't settled before they're expected to just engage in a whole new life. And that's psychologically going to be very, very distressing. And I appreciate that Arturo probably wants, like I said, to have some comfort and move on with his life. But his priority should have been his kids. And I don't think they were. Because to get married in such a short space of time, whilst your children are still dealing with the loss of a mother, you are not putting them first. Now, Taylor's grandmother actually said that she, as a child, had felt really lost when her dad did that, when he moved on to another family, as well as having to deal with the loss of her mum. So her grandmother has acknowledged that this is something that deeply affected Taylor. And like I said, it's not about being overjudgmental towards the father. It's just bringing into sharp focus the fact that children need time to grieve. They are dealing with an overwhelming pain. They often don't know how to process or manage it. And to some degree, when you've got fractures in your foundations because of a parent having things like dependency issues, you really do need a solid sense of support and security around you. And he isn't providing her with that or her brother with that by moving on so quickly. 
Then when Taylor's 11 years of age, she moves to Texas, and this is so that she can live with her grandparents on her father's side. She completed high school there, and then she moves back again to Wisconsin because she basically misses her father and her brother. But the fact that she moves to her grandparents, again, gives us insight into the fact that she was likely living in an environment with a step-parent and step-family that she wasn't happy with. And this isn't unusual. In fact, one of the biggest reasons for breakdowns in relationships of step-families is because when you merge and you start living with one another, you realise that you just don't complement one another's personalities and characteristics, and it means that the relationships fail. So it's likely that she wasn't fitting in to that new step family and the consequence of that is that she goes and lives with her paternal grandparents. It doesn't work out to some degree because she longs to be back with her father and brother. But like I said, it gives us a little bit of insight into the sense of dysfunction that she was probably experiencing. Then we get to 2018 and at this point she has another tragedy. Taylor's father, Arturo, is given a 12-year prison sentence and 18 years of supervision for the second-degree sexual assault of a child. So a 13-year-old girl said that he raped her in her bedroom. The original charges were actually rape by use of force or violence, but they ended up reducing the sentence. And it's at this point his second marriage ended. So the allegations are made, he's found guilty, and this ends the relationship between him and his partner and undoubtedly that's because the victim was related to his wife. But for Taylor Shabiznes, she's now in a situation where her father is a convicted rapist and that in itself is going to be very difficult to come to terms with. The transitions that she's going through in her life, the changes that she's experienced, the trauma that she's endured is going to have a huge impact. And bear in mind, when you think about the fact that she had a mother who chose dependency issues, so her mother dies of cirrhosis because of the problems that she has with alcohol, to some degree she's chosen that over her children, and now her father has essentially chosen prison over his children by acting in such a heinous way. So she's totally abandoned. And even though she has a brother, it's not the same as having primary caregivers. So she's dealt with all of this at a relatively young age. Now, in February 2020, she ends up getting married. She marries a boyfriend, Warren Shabiznes Shabau. That's his name, which is an interesting name, isn't it? Because if it was in different circumstances, it would sound, I don't know, like something from a film. Warren Shabiznes Shabau. But in these circumstances, it's just a name that's now associated with heinous crimes. So now Taylor is married and I imagine the reason that she got married was because she genuinely wanted a sense of security in her life. Not that she's necessarily making choices from a good place, but it makes perfect sense that when you've had a lot of dysfunction and a lot of loss and you feel abandoned to some degree by the people who are going to take care of you, then consequentially you're going to look at things that can make your life feel like they have more of a foundation. But she has problems in her life. So the following June, Taylor gets arrested. So basically, a man has called the emergency services because he wants a welfare check on a woman who, as far as he's concerned, seems to be under the influence of drugs. So when the police turn up to investigate, they attempt to talk to Taylor, they attempt to reason with her, but she says to the officers, why do I have to stop for you? Just going to throw it out there, Taylor, because they're a police officer. That's the most likely answer. She then says to him that she just shot up and was on a different planet. So she's being very honest in that moment. At this point, he kind of gets another officer to come because he needs some help. They turn up. And at this point, Taylor becomes really argumentative. And she starts to walk into oncoming traffic. So she's got absolutely no understanding of the danger that she's putting herself in. And that certainly demonstrates that she's at a very high level when it comes down to being under the influence because she's lost all sight or reason when it comes down to her own self-protection. And the fact that she's also getting into an argument with the police means that she's not thinking ahead. These people can arrest her. It's as simple as that. She can get charged with criminal activities if she doesn't follow what she's meant to be doing and what she's ordered to do. But she just isn't computing. She's on a completely different level. So at this point, the police officers obviously need to make her safe and for their own protection, they get hold of her. But she just starts to act out. She starts to kick them. And of course, if you injure a police officer, you are going to get charged. And she is. She's charged with battery on a member of law enforcement. And she's also charged with resisting arrest. So for this, 
she gets three months probation. And then around two months later, she is in trouble again. So a police officer had asked her to pull over because she was speeding and she was speeding. But as opposed to doing so, she decides that it's a far better idea to just speed away. So she runs through red lights. She's driving really, really dangerously. And that introduces you to the kind of mindset that she's got. She's clearly not concerned about her own welfare. And with respect, she's clearly not concerned about anybody else's welfare. Because if you're under the influence and driving, you can kill other people. So that doesn't cause her any concern. And it's so bad, her driving, that she almost crashes into a biker. So when the police do manage to apprehend Taylor, the first thing they find is drugs. She's got them in a car. They also find drugs paraphernalia, so a kit containing a syringe, a substance that tested positive for methamphetamine as well. So they have a bang to rights. Not only did she flee, she also has been found with substances that are illegal. At this point, she was charged with knowingly fleeing an officer, possession of drug paraphernalia, obstructing an officer, and not complying with the guidelines of her probation. Because bear in mind, she's on probation. And the cycle of an offender who offends this way when they're in a situation which can be grave for their well-being, because if you're on probation and then you do something wrong, the chances are you're going to get a more severe penalty, it suggests that there's no consequential thought process involved, so she's not thinking ahead. But also it says something about a level of self-worth. You can't have much self-worth if you're putting yourself at risk constantly and you're not thinking about the implications of your behaviour it suggests that she's got some real problems on a personality level regarding the way that she regards herself. So we get to January 2022 and she's actually given two years probation and three months in prison for all those offences I've just noted. But in the end, they reduced the actual prison sentence to house arrest. And I think that's a shame because when you are a chronic dependent and Taylor's your business is definitely a chronic drug addict, even though you can get drugs inside, it's more difficult. And there is a chance that if she'd gone to prison for a period of time, it might have broken the cycle. Now, later that same year, this is November 2020, Warren, her husband, gets arrested on drug charges. So he'd been found to have 46 grams of methamphetamine in his possession during a traffic stop. And he'd reportedly conspired with others to distribute. So basically, he was going to be dealing. So he agrees at this point to a plea deal where he pled guilty to the charge of knowingly and intentionally possessing with intent to distribute a mixture and substance containing a detectable amount of methamphetamine. So he agrees to that and therefore obviously is going to serve some time. He actually wrote on Facebook that he is currently locked up on federal charges because I was framed. I don't think you were framed. I think you were given a decent plea deal when you consider what you were caught with. He also wrote that he knows he'll be out by the January of 2024. So he's both psychic and also a victim. And in October 2021, she actually has a baby that she names Matteo. And she was really excited about this baby, but CPS end up taking him away around 24 hours after she's given birth. And Taylor goes to a shelter so that her grandmother can end up having custody of her son. So her grandparents do actually acquire custody of Matteo a month after his birth, and they do plan to adopt him. So at this point, we have seen a huge amount of upheaval in Taylor's business's life. She's not now got her husband present because he's in prison. Her father's in prison. She hasn't got a mother. Her grandparents have obviously been good in her life, but now they've got her child. She didn't likely want to have him taken off her, but that's something that's played out because of her dependency issues. And so she is going to have dealt with a huge amount of emotional collateral. And that can have an impact clearly on your mental health. Add that to dependency issues. And we really do have a cooking pot of possibility as regards how her future is potentially going to play out. So now that her husband's out of the picture, she has time, shall we say, to, I don't know, get involved in other activities and interests. And I will tell you, one of the things that Taylor's Your Business was amazing at was beadwork. So she's really artistic. I think that when we see individuals like her described in the press, we often only see one side. But if you go on her Facebook page, because I've done that, like some kind of crime stalker. And I've noticed that she's really artistic. I wouldn't say I would have bought any of the stuff because it's got a bit of a, I don't know, 
satanic looking twist to it, but she's very good at the beadwork that she does. So she had talent and at the same time, she's probably going to want some kind of comfort and she's looking because her partner isn't there anymore to find that elsewhere. And this is how she ends up with a guy called Shad Thirion. She'd been friends with him at school and they kept in contact and they had had some kind of relational experience with one another during those periods of time. And now he is available and her partner is unavailable. She starts having a sexual relationship with Shad. We get to February the 23rd, 2022. This really is where chaos begins to unveil itself. At 3.25 a.m., the police get a call to a home in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Tara Pakinich's boyfriend, so Tara is the mother of Shad Thirion, had put in the call because she had found her son's severed head in a bucket in the basement. Oh, don't in the damn bucket. <laughs> I, I can't, I, I call, man. She's a little freaked out and kind of freaking you out. Hey, President, my son's head is in a bucket. What do you mean? What? Oh. What makes you think that? Because I looked in the bucket. What, and what did you see? Exactly what I told you. Um. I don't even want to imagine how that would feel. I mean, we've all had those fears as a parent of getting a knock on the door to be told that something awful has happened to one of our children. Every parent in the universe of parents has had those thoughts run through their mind. It's part of what happens when you become a loving parent. You worry for the rest of your life about what could happen to your children. But there is no way that any of us as parents would conceive that one day we might go down into our own basement and find the severed head of our child. But that's exactly what happens for Tara. She had been woken up basically by a knock on the door. There'd been a storm and the door had slammed and she thought that potentially somebody was there. This was between 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning. And then she said that she heard a vehicle outside. So she gets up, notices that the basement light is on. So she just goes down to investigate. She's trying to figure out what's happening. She's heard this vehicle. She's heard this knock at the door, or at least a loud bang. And even though no one's there, she does notice this bucket at the bottom of the stairs. And it had been covered with a blanket and because she was curious and this is her house, she pulls back the blanket just to have a peer at what's inside. And she finds the severed head of her child. I do not know how anybody could ever recover from that moment. I cannot even conceive of the myriad of emotions, the vomit inducing horror the way that that would stain your conscience forever. How do you move forward from that moment? When the police arrive, they are horrified because this is genuinely something straight out of a horror movie. They quickly find weapons and more alarmingly, they find more body parts. So in the bucket that was containing the head, there was also a penis and there were two knives in there as well. There were some organs. Bags were discovered around the basement, so one of the bags contained the upper torso. There were some internal organs and a carving knife in a bag as well. And there was another bag that had a bread knife in it. They also found a mattress literally caked in blood and they could see quite a lot of drugs paraphernalia around, so you could see that people had been taking drugs. So Tara had said that the last time she'd seen a son was two days earlier on the 21st of February, and this was when Taylor, she business, had picked him up about 9.30 p.m. that evening. Tara's boyfriend, Steve, he had seen Shad and Taylor go into the basement in the early hours of the morning on February 22nd. So clearly the police now know that he had been with Taylor at the point and she was likely implicated, involved, or also a victim of a crime that had played out. Taylor had also been heard talking to Shad in the basement by Tara that day. So she'd heard the voices, but she hadn't actually physically seen them. So the police now start searching Shad's home. Obviously, they want to get as much detail as possible, make sure that the forensics are being gathered and figure out what the hell has played out for this young man's head 
to end up in a bucket and his body to be dismembered in such a brutal way. So they know that Taylor should business is with him, so clearly they're gonna to wanna to question her. So a police officer goes to her home and starts to inspect a van which they think is Taylor's. And as he's doing that, he actually sees Taylor coming out of her apartment building and she's wearing black sweatpants and a black sweatshirt. But the one thing that he becomes immediately aware of is that in spite of her wearing black, he can tell that she's got a significant amount of blood all over her. So he can see that she's got blood all over her hands and it's clearly all over her clothing as well. Hmm. Hey, who did that? Hi, Taylor, how's it going? Officer Russell with the Green Bay Police Department. Just make sure you ain't got nothing on you here. With Taylor. Taylor, you have a warrant for your arrest. Just put your hands behind your back with. Anybody else in your apartment? You got. Blood on your hands, your blood on. Your blood on your blood on. No, on your hands. Okay, yeah, we're going to have to. What apartment is what apartment are you in? Do you have it? And they come up. They cut some in after. On the double. Which apartment? One. One is what they came back to. Okay. Here. Come here. Come here. Yeah, go, 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 go. go. Guys, hurry up and get here now. Watch this window right here. Watch this window right here. Gun. Go in here. Go in here. Come to the back of the apartments. That's where we're at. You come over here. Two more will be fine. If uh, 84 is here, you have contact with the mail. Have a seat. Have a seat. Who else is in the apartment? Uh, Be straight up. Uh, Tones. Tones? Well, just Tones? Is he armed? Yeah. Nobody's armed? Nobody's armed. You sure? Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Negative, we got it up here. So at this point she's taken into custody and when they actually search the van, it is horrible. So behind the driver's seat, they find a crock pot box and in it is body parts, including legs. So the van itself belonged to Taylor's roommate, but she'd obviously used it. And you can't quite compute how that roommate would feel, can you? The idea that she has literally taken the van and used it in such a grotesque and gruesome way, I'm sure it probably found itself on auto trader, that van, because I don't know. I'm imagining you wouldn't want to keep hold of it when such a terrible and brutal thing had played out. So at this point, Taylor has been taken into custody and she's informed that Shad's head has been discovered because they're obviously going to be clear about why she's being taken in. And she replies at this point, that's pretty fucked up. Yep, I think we can all agree, Taylor. It is pretty fucked up that somebody's head's been found in a bucket in a basement where you were. So at this point they ask her about what happened and she comments that she blacked out. She said that she and Shad had been smoking marijuana, had been taking methamphetamine. She refers to methamphetamine as the bitch and they'd also shot up with trazodone and that's a really strong sedative. So they were heavily under the influence. They were also mixing some very toxic things together and it would make sense that potentially she had lost consciousness because she'd had so much. But losing consciousness is very different to being an individual who can murder somebody and literally dismember the body when they're apparently completely unaware of it. 
feels like there'd be a few stages involved in making a decision to dismember a body. It feels like you'd have to be conscious to be able to carry that out. But this is what she's saying at this moment in time, that she's been high, she's blacked out, and she's not really that sure of what played out and how it played out exactly. Well, she starts to describe what she considers are her recollection of events. So she says that Shad had brought two chains to the basement and they were like dog choke collars. She then said that she had choked Shad with one of the chains. They would allegedly done this before. And of course, we appreciate the BDSM community is a kink community where people engage in that consensually. And some people actually enjoy having a certain level of pain inflicted on them during sexual intercourse particularly choking, asphyxiation is one of those things that some people believe enhances orgasms. And if they've engaged in this behavior before, we're not judging them for finding that, shall we say, an addition to their sexual experience. But that's not what continues. That initial sex act that would have been consensual that they've done in the past is about to take an absolutely sinister and dark and deadly turn. She described that Shad was lay with his face down on the bed. She was on top of him. She actually described that she was riding him like a donkey at the time. And she said that she could feel Shad's heart beating as she was choking him and that she just went crazy. She just choked him harder. And she said that he wouldn't die, but kept rebuilding into muscle. That's what she says in her interrogation, which doesn't make sense. I imagine that you can think about scar tissue and that potentially she's thinking about being hurt and then it healing and then being stronger for it. But obviously that doesn't relate to choking somebody to death. I think you'll find that when it comes down to a chain in your neck, the chain is definitely going to win. But it also introduces me to the idea that she's not necessarily totally compassmentous when she's talking like this, because the idea that he can rebuild after she's actually choked him and that he wouldn't die doesn't make sense in reality or logic. She also talks about the fact that Shad's face turned purple and that he was coughing up blood. So this is really gruesome. And she admitted that even though she saw him coughing up blood, it didn't deter her. She just carried on strangling him until he was no longer alive. And then she talks about the fact she'd been waiting for him to die. And she estimated it took between three and five minutes, which must be a lifetime if you are the helpless victim in that moment. And bear in mind that if he had been laid face down and she got the chain around his neck and she's on top of him, it's going to be quite difficult for him to overpower her in that moment because obviously he's the wrong way around. She also talks about the fact that she really enjoyed choking him. She said, yeah, I liked it. And again, on one level, that sounds like somebody who's deeply evil because they're able to actually talk about how they enjoyed the experience. But on another level, we can say, well, is she really aware of what she's doing and saying in this moment? Because she's just admitting it all. And she's even going further and saying that she actually enjoyed the experience of murdering someone. Then she informs the police officers that she hadn't finished there. Nope. She carries on the sexual connection with him, even though he's now dead, and she assaults his body. So she sucks his penis, she puts a dildo in his mouth, a dildo in his anus, and she believes that she played with his body for around two to three hours, which is what we think of when we consider serial killers, isn't it? Those individuals who take great pleasure in killing and then enjoy the domination they have over the dead body. When you think about actions like that, you can't help but remember people like Jeffrey Dahmer because that's exactly what he did with his victims. And interestingly, Dahmer's gonna crop up again in this case down the line. So after she's had her fun, shall we say, she then dismembers the body and she cuts him up with kitchen knives that he actually takes from his mother's house. So she uses the kitchen knives from Shad's own mum to literally destroy his body. And she even goes on to say that the bread knife, because it had a serrated edge, was the best for doing that job. She also then goes on to say that she planned to take all of the dismembered body parts with her in the van, but that she got lazy. And she kind of almost laughs saying, I can't believe I forgot the head. But 
she gives all this information over to the police willingly. And when you watch her in the interrogation, and I have, I've watched the interrogation, you can't help but feel unsettled because of the fact that, firstly, the content is just so grotesque. I mean, she's talking about the literal execution, essentially, and dismemberment of a guy that she was meant to be friends with. That in itself is horrific to listen to. But it's the way she acts. There's a part of you that thinks, is she disassociated from this? Is she talking about this and understanding that this is real? Did you have sex with his body at all? Any points or any type of sexual contact? You know, obviously the dildo and stuff. I put the dick in his ass. Hmm? I grind it on him, I put the dick in his ass. I, I you grind it on? Yeah, I listen to Did you ever put his penis in your vagina? There's another part of you that thinks, is she just enjoying discussing this? Is she proud of her work? It's really unsettling. But the very fact that she kind of almost giggles and says, I can't believe I forgot the head. It's just so distinct from what we'd expect when talking about something so grotesque. So there is absolutely no way she's going to get away with this crime. Obviously, she's admitted that she's done it. She's been seen at the scene of the crime. The body parts have been found in her possession. And she's said the words that she said in the interrogation. So she is 100% going down for this. So the first time that Taylor actually appears in court is February the 14th, 2023. Her lawyer, Quinn Jolly, he argues that her trial which was due to begin on the 6th of March, needed to be delayed until May at the earliest. And the reason for that is he wanted more time to get experts to assess the case and to basically testify on Taylor's behalf concerning whether she was actually competent to stand trial. Taylor was very unhappy with this. It's probably the easiest way of describing it because she actually attacks her lawyer. She's handcuffed at the time, but she goes for them. So we can definitely acknowledge that she is clearly very unstable. Bearing in mind, this is her defense attorney who's basically trying to gather more information that could help her with the case. But apparently Taylor doesn't see things this way. And fortunately, a security guard in the courtroom manages to restrain her. But shall we say this leads to her getting a new lawyer, which makes sense. Because if I was somebody who was doing my best for a client and they thought that the best way to deal with that was to aggress me, I too would think that maybe it was time for us both to move on. Rachel, call. I'm looking at uh, the week of May 15 for the trial. Go. Stop it. Okay. Stop it. Rachel, call. But again, that makes me feel that she isn't computing the world in a competent manner. Because why would you attack the very person trying to defend you? And to be fair, 
somebody who is clearly doing a decent job because getting experts who can testify that you are not in your right mind, for example, is going to benefit you. But then if you're not in your right mind, why would you see the world that way? So either way you look at it, I don't think that Taylor's your business really is in her right mind in that moment. On July 13th, 2023, forensic psychologist, Dr. Diane Litton, they determined that Taylor wasn't competent for trial. They said that she showed signs of an active psychotic disorder. The first time that she actually met Taylor, she had thrown a chair at her. And this is after she'd refused to talk. So that again is really atypical behavior. Clearly that suggests that there is something going on as far as Taylor is concerned. She is not computing the world around her as she should be doing. This woman is there to help her, not to hand her. And yet she's being violent towards her too, as she had been to her own lawyer. I also have a little bit of sympathy. I feel sorry for Dr. Lytton. There she is just trying to do a job and the next minute she's trying to avoid a chair hitting her head. But one of the things that she said was the expressions on Taylor's face just didn't match the context of what was being discussed. So she was often inappropriately smirking or smiling. That actually plays out quite a lot. So when you watch court appearances of Taylor, she does smirk, she does smile in the weirdest of places. And she just demonstrates a complete lack of insight. So this particular doctor is saying, you know, she does not match what she is saying with her actual body language and the way that she comes across just doesn't make sense. Also, this doctor said that she'd had an experience of hallucinations and that she was experiencing being told to hurt people or to hurt herself and that she genuinely doesn't understand any of the proceedings that are going on. So as far as Dr. Lutton is concerned, it's not possible that Taylor can really participate in her own defense. But the court, also bringing the witness, psychologist Dr. Matthew Siepel, and he said that Taylor was absolutely competent to stand trial. So the judge goes with that, rules that Taylor is competent to stand trial. And I'm quite conflicted here because I genuinely think that Taylor Shabiznes is not acting in a way that suggests she's cogent, but equally that could be a bias down to the fact that I don't believe that people can possibly be this evil and actually it's probably that that is clouding my judgment at times. But genuinely, I do feel that Dr. Lytton is probably correct and that she isn't acting in a way that suggests that she's competent. So there is disagreement, but like I said, they go down the route of believing that she is competent. And so the trial begins on the 24th of July, 2023. And her defense attorney hadn't actually wanted certain information to be brought into court. They'd actually asked that certain searches on her phone not be mentioned to the jury. They felt that it could persuade them in a direction that wouldn't be good for her defense. And she'd done things like searching for Jeffrey Dahmer. She'd done searches for Satanism, actually the Satanism ones and the relations to Satanism, they weren't put before the jury but the Dharma stuff was brought in. She'd searched weird stuff like Jeffrey Dharma's butt and looking sexy when you appear in court and things like that. But clearly the defense was trying to say, if you put that in front of a jury, it's gonna persuade them that this woman was premeditating killing somebody and wanted to emulate somebody that she was clearly a little bit fixated with. In this case, she was fixated potentially with Dharma. And when you look at how she actually dismembered the body, they could think, oh, well, she absolutely knew what she was doing. She modeled herself on Dharma and therefore she's definitely guilty and she's sane because she was planning it. But the judge said, well, yeah, that might be the case. So yes, it may indeed persuade the jury. So if I was on a jury and somebody came in and was like, well, this case is about a woman who has dismembered this poor man and she's obsessed with Dharma. She likes a bit of Satanism. And at the end of the day, it turns out that she'd been searching for things that allude to this particular connection. And by the way, the victim's mother discovered his head in a bucket. I'd probably think to myself, yeah, she's guilty as hell. And with respect, she must have known what she was doing because she's literally pumping herself with these kind of things that titillate her. In this case, a serial killer who is absolutely obsessed with dismembering his victims. And there she is emulating this. But her defense lawyer felt that that wasn't fair. Like I said, the judge disagreed with him.
and it was introduced. So during the trial, Taylor pleads not guilty by reason of insanity. And when they look at her history, listen, she'd had a lot of problems with her mental health. So she'd suffered from her first bout of mental health issues before the age of 12, and she'd received mental health treatment when she was 12 because she had problems with concentration, she had attention issues that she was experiencing in school. So these were symptoms presumed to stem from ADD or ADHD. She was given an antipsychotic, an antidepressant, and a mood stabiliser when she was a teenager, and I mean a young teenager, and they are heavy duty meds. I really struggle when I hear about children who we're talking about at the ages of 14 and 15 are on antipsychotics and antidepressants and mood stabilizers because that is a heady mix for a developing brain and they're not very enjoyable to take. I'm sure that any of you who've been on any of these particular tablets will appreciate that they can be very upsetting psychologically and also physically. So for a young developing girl, this is going to be something that she doesn't enjoy. And when she's 18, she just chooses to stop taking the medication. Taylor is diagnosed with PTSD and bipolar disorder that happened in May 2021. She actually tries to take her own life. So we are not talking about a happy person. We are talking about an individual who is struggling deeply with her mental health and mental illness. And the fact that she doesn't like taking tablets is going to be problematic because if you do have something that is deeply worrying about your mental health and you need that attended to by taking the right medication and you fail to do that, it can result in some pretty bad things happening. But I also think it gives us an insight into just how much dysfunction she's endured in her life and the consequences of that dysfunction playing out in her mental health. And not wanting to be here and trying to take your own life demonstrates a level of unhappiness that very few of us reach in our worlds. And that's something that she's obviously gone through for a long period of time to eventuate and feeling that she no longer can be here. We get to the 26th of July, 2023. This is when the jury start hearing about exactly what happened to Shad, because Shad is the victim in this case. And as much as I do believe that Taylor Shabusiness is somebody who genuinely has real mental health problems, that doesn't make you a killer. At the end of the day, you can be a killer and also develop a mental illness, but it is who you are that makes those actions occur, not the mental illness that you develop. And that's really essential to state because I think that the area of mental illness is so stigmatized that we don't want to additionalize that by suggesting that if you are somebody who has mental health issues or develops a mental illness that you are likely to go out and kill. You're not. But like I said, you can be a killer who develops one. So the jury then start to hear about exactly what played out that fateful night. And they also hear the interview that happens on Taylor's arrest. They have to go through graphic photos. They have to look at body cam footage of the crime scene. They also hear the 911 call from Shad's mother. The medical examiner who gives the court the information said that the body was essentially bloodless. They said that his body had been flayed and defleshed. The back muscles had been removed to expose the rib cage and spine. The torso had been cut in half and that meant that there was access to remove the organs that she removed and they also noted that one of Shad's feet had been stuffed into his chest. So she has taken a hell of a lot of time doing that. I mean you have to think about the physicality involved in actually sawing somebody in half and also the fact that you'd imagine that for most of us your stomach would be turned immediately. Even if let's suggest that she killed him by mistake, although it does seem that she admitted to enjoying it. But let's just take, for example, that it was a mistake and she suddenly realised she'd gone too far. You wouldn't imagine that after you realise, the first thing you're going to do is think, right, OK, I'm going to dismember them. Even if you were thinking, I need to get rid of the body, the idea of actually dismembering a body, it's an enormous thing to do. And the first cut when you start trying would make most of us throw up. But it seems like she didn't just enjoy it, she relished it. Because she has literally cut him into pieces. And to psychologically be able to do that, it says something very malevolent about you. 
Because even if we're to believe that she's not mentally cogent, the actual energy that it would take to dismember his corpse, the actual stomach-inducing, stomach-churning experience you'd imagine you'd have to go through would be enough to stop you from carrying on the process on the whole, but not her. She genuinely has taken great pleasure, it seems, and that's why I do feel that she has this connection with wanting to kill, wanting to dismember. And I guess this is where the prosecution have an issue with the insanity plea, because if she's in a psychotic break, you would imagine that she wouldn't take as much time enjoying herself with the body. You'd think to yourself that she would probably be in a state of confusion and distress, even if she was under the influence of drugs. If she was having a psychotic break, that's what you'd imagine. But what we're introduced to here is very much something like Vampire of Sacramento, Richard Chase, a serial killer who used to ingest the organs and drink the blood of his victims. This is the same kind of level of crime that we see in his particular murders. And arguably the fact that she's got this connection to Dharma and she's intrigued and interested in him. Is she trying to emulate somebody like Dharma? Is she trying to be a serial killer of that level in this moment? You know, if she hadn't been caught, would this have happened again? And I guess that they're believing that, yes, she might be somebody who's suffering with mental illness, but she did know what she was doing, why she was doing it, and she enjoyed doing it. She literally relished it. The fact that one of his feet is stuffed into his chest, it's like she's trying to do something to the body that is so grotesque that it amuses her. I genuinely mean that. I think playing with him this way, humiliating his corpse this way, deriding him in such a grotesque manner, she finds great pleasure in doing that. So if you are a jury member and you are listening to the description of the medical examiner, it's going to be very difficult for you to imagine that this person was not aware of what was happening. And that's what you're going to be thinking about when you come into your conclusion. Is this person not guilty because they are insane? Or is this person culpable because they seem to have taken a great deal of pleasure in the killing? And also, it takes quite a lot of energy and quite a lot of time to dismember Shad's body. So she's had a lot of opportunity to recoil from that, to stop doing it, and she carries it on. Add that to the connection with Dharma, and I think that she's going to be damned, because the reality is, it's going to be hard to suggest that she hasn't got an awareness of what she's doing when you look at the level of what played out in Shad's murder. So it is unsurprising after I've just described what the medical examiner brought in, and clearly all the evidence where Taylor has admitted that she's killed Shad, that when the jury go away to deliberate on this, it only takes them an hour, well actually just a little bit less than an hour, to find a guilty of first degree intentional homicide, as well as sexual assault and dismemberment. I think it's an open and shut case regarding the jury there. They see that there is no way that this is anything but murder, and that's why it takes them such a small amount of time to deliberate. But then we get to the second phase of her trial. So this is July 27th, 2023. And this is, of course, to determine whether she's responsible for her actions. And this is one where I think a lot of people in my field would be on the fence because it just seems so unusual and left field for somebody to actually act this way. And particularly a female. I mean, we all know about the killers out there who enjoy dismembering bodies, serial killers who have taken great pleasure in doing the things that I've described Taylor doing. But as a female, it's not very often we see these things play out at all. And the fact that she's had these mental health problems in the past could make you feel a little bit uncertain about saying that she was competent and therefore that she was guilty because she was somebody who genuinely knew what she was doing. And I imagine for the jury this would be a little bit more difficult because was she responsible for her actions? Did she actually know what she was doing? She took a lot of time doing it gonna throw it out. She did take a lot of time. She seemed to revel in it, one could say, but was she responsible? It is possible that somebody can be insane and can enjoy doing what they're doing and seemingly carry out the most reprehensible things, but not 
be in control of her actions because of their insanity. And Taylor's father, Arturo, he testified for her, said that she was often not in her right mind when she was growing up. He said that she really struggled with mental health, that they'd sought help for Taylor multiple times. She'd have hallucinations. She would very rarely be in a state of mind that he would say was completely cogent. He said that he always had massive concerns about her mental health. He said that when she'd had Matteo, her son, he actually took her to a psychiatric centre because he was really scared that she would hurt herself. He was scared that she genuinely wasn't in her right mind at all. He also commented that she'd been on lots of medications. He also said that she hadn't liked taking the medication and that they messed her up. And arguably, that isn't an uncommon feeling. I do have a lot of sympathy and empathy with people who are on very strong and psychotics, etc., because they can make you feel very different and they can make you feel unsettled and they can have some really nasty side effects. So lots of people are resistant to taking these medications. Equally, if she should be on that medication because she is enduring things like psychotic breaks, then it's going to be problematic if she chooses not to do so. Now, the defence, they argued that Taylor qualified for an NGI plea, not guilty by reason of insanity, based on the diagnosis of a serious mental disorder. They said that this impacted on her ability to know right from wrong, and also this would impact on her ability to control her behaviours. So she'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder for several years, and the defence psychologist said that, as far as they were concerned, she was not criminally responsible for her actions. However, it was argued by the prosecution that Taylor did know her actions were wrong. And the reason for this is, first of all, she attempted to clean up the basement where she killed Chad. And that is incriminating because if you're trying to clean up a crime scene, it means that you know that you carried out a crime. Also, the fact that she cut up his body, that could be seen as an attempt to remove evidence. Although it could also be seen as something that she enjoyed doing because she was delusional. Also, there is a problem with the NGI plea because she was under the influence and because the actions were drug fueled, it meant that essentially she wasn't even eligible to be considered for that plea. So it's determined at this point that at the time that she committed the murder, Taylor was of sound mind and that she wasn't suffering from any mental disease or defect that impacted her ability to recognise right from wrong or to behave lawfully. So therefore she would be sent to prison rather than a psychiatric institution. It only took the jury an hour to come to that decision. I'm a bit conflicted here. I know that she absolutely needs to be sent away, probably for the rest of her natural life, but I do feel that she is somebody who is dealing with mental decline. I don't think her actions mean that she is in any way less culpable for what she's been convicted of. I think she is, but I do think that she is somebody who is not processing the world around her accurately or appropriately. And I do feel that it would be better for her to be sent to a psychiatric institution, at least for evaluation and for a period of time. But nonetheless, that isn't what happens. She's sent to prison. So we get to sentencing that takes place on the 26th of September 2023. Taylor attends the actual sentencing half an hour late. They don't give any reason for the delay, but I imagine... It's because of her. After all, when she was in a room with a person who was meant to be helping her, she threw a chair at them. I can't imagine getting her to court is going to be very easy. She actually arrived in court wearing a spit hood. So a spit hood is something that's put on a prisoner to protect those around them. So if there's a prisoner who has a tendency to bite or spit, you want to make sure that people aren't going to be affected by that. And even though they don't actually specifically say why she's wearing it, Brown County Jail said it was because she was being behaviourally problematic. And like I've noted, it was a safety precaution for the people around her. Now, when it comes down to people talking about what needs to happen to Taylor, they had family members who spoke on her behalf. They described the immense trauma she experienced when she lost her mum. So Taylor's grandmother said that she felt that she had gone through a lot in a short time and that even though Taylor had done a terrible thing and that she definitely needed help and counselling, she did feel that she should have the opportunity to return to society. I get it, but I have to say that when we're talking about Taylor, we are talking about somebody who is very, very dangerous. Because even if you have all the counselling in the world, 
the root of what is going on with this woman is that there is something very malevolent within her nature. I appreciate that she is drug addled. I appreciate that she is somebody who has had some horrible traumas in her life at the time of the crime. But the level of engagement she has with the total annihilation of that corpse and the time that she takes and the atrocities that she commits, that does suggest that there is a level of, shall we say, darkness running through her veins. And all the counselling in the world, all the trauma work in the world, isn't going to change that. And with respect to people who are horrifically traumatised in their lives, they're not going around killing and dismembering people. That isn't how trauma plays out. In fact, you're far more likely to harm yourself than anybody else. But her grandmother went on to say that Taylor was a really trusting person and that she'd been used by people who she believed cared about her. Well, yeah, that happens to a lot of us. But the difference is we don't murder innocent people in the most gratuitous of ways. But I understand when you love somebody, you see past the things that they do. Sometimes, sadly, a detriment to yourself or in this case, potentially a detriment to society in the long term. Toxicologist James O'Connell, he spoke about Taylor's drug use and he described methamphetamines as being one of the most addictive drugs. He said it can cause hallucinations, it can cause psychosis. And Taylor's defense actually said that she'd used 51 hits of meth prior to murdering Shad. That's right, I said that. 51 hits of meth prior to murdering Shad. I'm surprised that she was conscious. James said that he never heard of that much being used at one time and that it could definitely have impaired her judgment, it could definitely have impaired her perception of consequences and as far as they were concerned it could have exacerbated symptoms of her mental illness, that goes without saying. I think we can all agree that if you have a fracture in your mental health and then you amplify that by chemical induction, there is a chance your behaviour will be more extreme and will be problematic for you but again there are a lot of people who are heavily dependent on drugs. They are not doing what Taylor is doing. When it comes down to the victim impact statements, Shad's uncle gave one and he said that she had done one of the most cowardly, weakest things possible. She'd gained Shad's trust and then she'd fully taken advantage of his kindness in the most grotesque of ways. He also commented that Shad's family won't be able to recover from this and that he doesn't understand why Taylor should be given a chance of parole. But shockingly, Shad's father, well, he says something completely unprecedented as far as I'm concerned. He said he forgave her. He said that he forgave her for what she did and that she's the person who's going to have to live with the horrible consequences of making a bad choice and that hating her is not going to help him. Okay, if you could just, sir, before you start, if you just state your name for the record. Michael Therian. Go ahead. Uh, Taylor, I just wanted to say that uh, I forgive you for what you've done to my son. And, uh, yeah, you made a bad choice, and now you have to live with it. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to miss Shad. He was, a, he was a wonderful child, too, he, growing up just mild-mannered and just happy and and uh, I know you made a bad choice, and and uh, like I said, I forgive you, and and I'm gonna ask the judge if he can, you know, if she can see the streets again sometime, you know. It, it may not be soon, but uh, I believe I believe everybody uh, makes bad choices, and maybe not to the scale, but. Uh, I think there's a lot of hope for you. I think, you know, you can make use of your time and be a better person and uh, do great things yet, you know, so. It does no good for me to hate you, you know. Uh, I know, I know you got a heart. I know you got a mind. And uh, I wish you no harm and I, and I hope things I hope things go well for you. That's all I got to say. Okay, thank you. So it, he actually potentially believes that in the future, if she can be helped, 
that she could end up back on the streets and he'd be willing to have that happen as long as the work that needed to take place occurred. And that to me is astonishing. When you think about how Shad was killed, it is just absolutely devastating to imagine that happening to somebody that you love. And yet somehow he finds it within his psyche, within his spirit to actually say that he doesn't want her to suffer and that he does believe that she deserves a life of meaning. Taylor's also offered the opportunity to speak before her sentence is passed, but she said that there's nothing that she wanted to say. I'm gonna throw it out there. Probably be a good time to say sorry to Shad's family, but that's the thing about Taylor. She has never, ever shown any remorse whatsoever. In fact, that's one of the things that the prosecution commented on. The fact that she showed absolutely no care, consequence or concern for the impact that she'd had, for the brutal execution of somebody that was meant to be a friend. So that in itself really went against her. Now referring to the pre-sentence investigation, Taylor actually said, I don't have any regrets about what I did and I do not feel remorseful for Shad. Again, it's quite unusual even if you had wanted to kill somebody, not to just play the game, to act like you're remorseful for your actions, to try to garner the sympathy of those around you, to get people to look at you as a human being, not a cold, calculating murderer. But she doesn't. She just acknowledges that she's totally cool with her actions. And that, again, makes me really conflicted. Because it could be that we are dealing with somebody so evil, so malevolent, so dark, that she's happy and proud of her work. But equally, we could be dealing with somebody who genuinely doesn't compute the world appropriately because she is very, very unwell. Judge Walsh, he said that Taylor's crime offends human decency, it offends human dignity, and it offends the human community. He said that the public needs protection from her because when this kind of offence can occur with no advance warning signs, absolutely anything is possible. She was sentenced to life in prison. Of course she was. None of us were imagining that wouldn't be the case. She was convicted of first degree intentional murder without the possibility of parole. They also gave her an extra 10.5 years in prison and eight years of extended supervision for the mutilation of a corpse and sexual assault. I do love the States. She's literally been put to prison for the rest of her natural life, but they decide to add on 10.5 years in prison and eight years of extended supervision. When's she getting supervised? Is that happening in hell? I'm not sure how that supervision would work. You know, you're sitting there in your probation office. She's got this new case for you. Okay? Okay, hang on a minute. This, uh, this says that the person spent their entire natural life in prison. Yeah, they did. Yeah, so <laughs> why, why, why am I involved? Oh, because you're the probation officer that we've assigned the case. Yeah, I know, but the dead, the whole sentence was served in prison and the dead, right? Yeah, right, but you'll note that they also got eight years supervision. I don't get this. You're going to have to go and supervise them. Where? Well, in hell, actually. So, don't know about you, but I think about taking a costume as opposed to wearing any woolens because it's going to be hot down there. I don't want to do this. Go! That's the kind of thing that I'm playing out in my head because it's ridiculous, isn't it? But I kind of love the American system. They're like, at the end of the day, she spent the whole life in prison. We're gonna go those extra years just in case there is a hell and we can get a probation officer down there for those extra eight years of time. And Taylor's husband, Warren, is also supporting his wife despite the fact that she's incarcerated for the rest of her life. In a Facebook post, he wrote, my wife, Taylor Shabusiness, might be locked up for a long time, stroke forever. I like how he did that long time, stroke, forever. Obviously remaining hopeful that something might change there, but that doesn't change the fact that she's my wife. I'm always gonna stand behind her no matter what. Fuck anyone 
who's done anything to say about my empire, because right now, all that matters is that my wife is okay. He also actually seemed to make a joke about the way that Shad was killed, writing, nothing anyone says can bother me. I'm still breathing with my head on, lol. Well, it might not have been on if you hadn't been incarcerated, because who's to say your head wouldn't have ended up in a bucket if you'd been the one there that night? Also in another post he wrote, come my release, there will be lots more to know about myself and my wife. And he used the hashtags, hashtag, Free my wife Taylor your business and hashtag loyalty over everything. Which is really ironic considering the fact that his wife was having sex with Shad whilst married to him. Just throwing it out there, but that feels a little bit twisted. Also, no matter what he knows about his wife, no matter how good she may have been to him in his life, she's still a murderer. And she's a murderer who carried out a crime so reprehensible, so grotesque, that it's stomach churning to even imagine. Now in cases like this, so where there's a lot of intrigue surrounding the murderer, I think that one of the things that gets lost is the victim. Because when we're talking about this woman, we get absolutely embroiled in the horror of her actions. And because it's so unusual, you concentrate your energies on that. But we talking about a man who lost his life. Shad had a whole future. He was a young man. Shad was said to be a really nice person. His obituary actually said he was a kind and compassionate person who put others before himself. He had an interest in music. He liked camping. He was apparently a talented artist. He really enjoyed wood carving. And he was just 24 years of age when he had his life cut short. And I think it's really essential that we remember that that Shad Therion was an individual of meaning to this world who arranged an evening with a girl he clearly liked and he ended up in pieces because of that. And when you think about his mother, she has to live day in, day out with the trauma that she certainly will have suffered from finding her son's body that way. And I guess the biggest conflict in this case is whether we believe that this woman, Taylor Shabiznes, was somebody who knew what she was doing, plotted to do it, went ahead and did it, enjoyed doing it, and has absolutely no remorse for doing it. Or whether she is an individual who really isn't sane and really wasn't aware of her actions and potentially did believe, as she said in the police interview, that he could be rebuilt and therefore none of what's happened to her is actually something that she computes, and therefore, to some degree, she's a victim as well. That's the thing that causes me conflict. I guess it is possible that Taylor Shea Business can absolutely be insane, can absolutely have had horrendous things happen in her life, that we can feel a sadness and sympathy for any mental illness that she's developed, but that we can equally acknowledge that her actions are evil and you have to have a sinister part of your personality to be able to go ahead and do what she did even if she was not in her right mind whilst doing it because you can absolutely be evil and also be mentally ill the question is in this case was that what actually happened but i guess the only person who has the answer is taylor she business herself and I doubt very much she'll be answering that question any time soon. Let me know your thoughts on this case, guys. It is one really gruesome one to have covered. And like I said, it's so unusual to see a woman doing this and so disconcerting to imagine that you can literally hook up with somebody that you trusted from school, that you get on well with, that you see as a buddy and find yourself in the position that Shad Therion found himself having his life snuffed out in the most gruesome way before being butchered into pieces by somebody that he trusted. Let me know your thoughts. Take care, guys. Be safe.